This is gonna blow your mind. Let's talk about it. So if you're interested in purchasing an RTX 40 or RX 7000 series GPU, you might just want to watch this video because as it turns out, these GPUs are so powerful in a lot of cases, you might be forced into making several other upgrades to your system and it's important you don't choose the wrong parts because at best you could be leaving performance on the table and at worst you could end up melting your new GPU, which is why today we're going to be taking a look at Intel's brand new 13th generation CPUs to figure out do you need to upgrade or not? And if so, what CPU is right for you? Now, even if you've already seen benchmarks of all the latest CPUs, I highly suggest you stick around till the end on this one, guys, because not only will I be showing off some high-speed 7800 MHz DDR5, but I also found some information you might not have seen before that could change your opinion on what you should or shouldn't buy. Now, before we get into the actual benchmarks, real quick, I want to thank Kingston for sending over their Fury Renegade 4TB PCIe 4 drive, which I used for this video and is rated for up to 70 300 megabytes per second speeds and is also one of the only drives I can confirm has four gigabytes of DRAM cache on the PCB. And I also want to give a big thank you to Intel for sending over a 13900K, 13600K MSI Z790-P Wi-Fi DDR4 board and 32 gigabytes of G-Skill 3600CL16 DDR4 memory. As for the other components used, these were all purchased myself, but for the i9s, I used an EVGA Z690 Kingpin Dark motherboard, 32 gigabytes of 7200 megahertz CL34 G skill DDR5 memory, and an RTX 4090 Supram liquid overclocked, which was used for all CPU testing. Now, speaking of testing, we're going to be taking a look at 10 different games today, although for the sake of brevity, we're just going to be showing three on screen, and hopefully soon the other seven should be available for you to take a look at over on my Patreon. And then we're going to take a look at a 10 game average chart. We're also going to be taking a look at some benchmarks when it comes to productivity and we're going to be taking a look at the power draw and the platform cost as well. Now, one more quick thing I want to go over before we get into those benchmarks is I just want to let you guys know that yes, there will be overclocked in stock results. And for the overclocks on the i9-13900K, I was able to get the P cores to 5.7 gigahertz. I was able to get the cache to 5 gigahertz and I was able to get the E cores to 4.4. Now, in terms of the memory, I was able to get it up to 7800 megahertz CL34 with some Titan subtimings. Now, talking about the 12900K, this one I was able to get up to 5. 1 gigahertz on the P cores. I was able to get the cache up to 4.3 gigahertz and I was able to get the E cores up to 4 gigahertz. Now in terms of the memory on that, I was only able to get 7200 megahertz out of that kit. Now you could probably get a little bit more speed out of this, but I was very, very time constrained and the best I could get was 7200 with much tighter timings than the 7800 that I got on the 13900K. It just was simply a lot easier to clock the memory higher on the new 13th gen processor, at least on my current motherboard on its current BIOS. And then finally, taking a look at the 13600K here, I was able to get 5.5 gigahertz for the P cores, 4.9 gigahertz on the cache. And then for the E cores, I was able to get 4.3 gigahertz. Now as for the memory, I was able to get this 3600 megahertz CL16 kit up to 4000 megahertz CL16. Although do keep in mind, this is not BDI memory, so it's not necessarily the best DDR4 you can get. So if you are able to purchase some BDI DDR4 memory, your results probably will be a little bit better as those sub timings are going to be a little bit tighter. But with that out of the Way, let's go ahead and take a look at the benchmarks and first starting off with Fortnite at 1080p using ultra settings we can see here that the 13900k with ddr5 7800 is comfortably on top it's then followed by the stock 13900k then the overclock 12900k then the overclock 13600k and then finally and last the 12900k stock then taking a look at spider-man 1080p ultra settings using dlss on quality once again we have the 13900k oc on top 13900k stock is coming next 12900k oc is next then we have the 12900k stock and then interestingly and last we have the 13600k then moving on to rainbow six siege at 1080p using ultra settings once again in first place we have the 13900k oc then we have the 13900k stock then we have the 12900k oc 12900k stock and then in last once again we have the 13600k oc using that ddr4 4000 memory then taking a look at the multi-core benchmarks here we have Cinebench R20 
2023 where the 13900K is comfortably on top with 42,284 points, just a little bit ahead of its stock result, although it is massively ahead of the 12900K KOC and actually stock versus stock, the 13900K is over 49% faster than the 12900K. And then the 13600K here actually comes in with a surprising 26,000 points, which puts it pretty close to the 12900K, which is very, very impressive. As later on in the video, you will see it draws a lot less power. Then moving on to Blender Junk Shop, here you can see that in first place we have the 13900K, then the 13900K stock comes in just behind it. Then we have the 12900K. 900K OC coming in next at a significant drop off, the 12900K stock, and then finally and last we have the 13600K OC, which is to be expected considering that it does have fewer threads than all these other CPUs, although I do want to point out that once again stock versus stock, the 13900K is actually over 46% faster than the 12900K in this benchmark. So yes, it is much, much faster. Then moving on to the Puget benchmarks, here you can see that the 13900K definitely is on top when it comes to these Adobe programs. 13900K stock is gonna be next. Then just behind that, we have the 12900K OC. Then we have the 13600K OC, which is actually to be expected considering that it does have much higher clocks and higher clocks are gonna matter quite a bit when it comes to this Adobe software. And then in last, we have the i9-12900K using the stock settings in DDR5-7200. But now let's go ahead and take a look at that 10 game average to see where things are actually gonna fall because earlier in the video, as you saw in two of the three games, the 13600K was actually in last, but taking a look at the 10 game average, it looks like that's actually not the case. It's not in last, it's comfortably between the 12900K stock and the 12900K OC, which is a pretty dang good result considering that this CPU and overall platform cost is much, much cheaper. Now, in terms of the 13900K stock versus stock, it's actually about 12% faster on average versus the 12900K, and in terms of 1% lows, about 11% faster. Now, in terms of OC versus OC, this is a little bit more interesting. It's about 10% faster than the 12900K, but when it comes to the 1% lows, it's actually an incredible 19% faster. So that's actually a very, very interesting result and shows that 7800 MHz DDR5 definitely does have its advantages when it comes to the frame rate consistency. Now, speaking of frame rate consistency, although the 13600K average does look pretty good, unfortunately, it looks like the 0.1% lows are suffering considerably because of this non b die DDR4, because although it is 4000 MHz CL16, some of those sub timings aren't quite as tight as some other DDR4 on the market. So again, if you do have b die you probably could increase these results at least a little bit. Although I do think this is a good example to show why DDR5 is going to be much better than DDR4, especially going forward. As you can see here, that actually the 13900K with its 7800 MHz DDR5 is 20 57% faster on the 1% lows and an incredible roughly 50% faster on the 0.1% lows. So that is definitely very, very interesting because again, yes, it's not the best DDR4 on the market, but this still is 4000 CL16 and it is getting smoked by the 7800 megahertz kit because I think it's important to notice that the 13600K should, with the same memory, definitely be beating the 12900K. The only real difference between the 13900K and the 13600K is, yes, the 13900K has two more P cores, but that shouldn't matter too much. What should matter is the only basically 200 megahertz difference in the core clock. That's not a lot of performance. So I think the main reason as to why you're seeing such lower 0.1% lows, especially, on the 13600K is because yes, DDR5 at 7800 megahertz is just simply much better than DDR4 even at 4000 megahertz. That extra bandwidth is just gonna help a lot and honestly, you don't even need to see benchmarks to know that yes, 8000 megahertz or close to 8000 megahertz DDR5 is gonna be much better than any DDR4 on the market because although DDR4 can have up to like 10% or even in extreme cases, 15% lower latency than DDR5, it is gonna come at the cost of a massive bandwidth reduction as DDR5 can have up to double the amount of bandwidth of DDR4. And in a lot of games, 
that's going to matter a lot. And I do have a good mix of games, I think. Uh, again, I'll have them on my Patreon, and I will include in the description which games I tested. But I think across these 10 different games using multiple runs, that I'm very confident in telling you that DDR5 is just much faster, and it's going to continue to get much faster going forward into the future. But now let's quickly talk about the power draw. And here we're just gonna be taking a look at the peak power draw that I observed. This is not gonna be gaming power draw, as honestly guys, they're all gonna draw such an insignificantly low amount of power that it's just really not even worth measuring. But in terms of the peak power draw, there's definitely gonna be a big difference as there's a large difference in terms of the amount of cores available. So if you're using all those cores, yeah, there's gonna be a big difference and it definitely shows as the 13600K is drawing a lot less power than any of the other CPUs, especially that 13900K overclocked, reaching nearly 400 watts, that's a lot of power that you're gonna have to dissipate. And without using thermal velocity boost, it's gonna be very difficult to keep 5.7 gigahertz nice and cool, depending on what types of multi-core programs you're gonna be running. And honestly, I just wanna highlight once again how impressive the 13600K is, because remember, this was getting similar multi-core results to the 12900K, and it's doing it for about 80 watts less power or thereabouts. So that's pretty dang good for the 13600K when it comes to the power. But now let's talk about the platform cost because yes, DDR5 is gonna be faster, but at what cost? As you can see here that the 13900K comes in at a very pricey, $1,430, and if we break it down, it comes down to around $660 for the CPU, as that's the lowest I saw it available over the last couple of weeks. $350 for that 7200 megahertz kit of RAM and $420 for that Z690 Dark Kingpin motherboard. Now, similar amounts for the 12900K, but the CPU is a little bit cheaper, so it's gonna be $1,270. Then the 13600K comes in at a much cheaper $625. If we break it down, the CPU is available right now for $320. The RAM was $115, and then the motherboard was $190. Now, I didn't get a chance to actually put in any performance performance numbers for the 5800X 3D, but I know that a lot of people are gonna be very interested in the CPU, so I did decide to include it in my platform cost, as I know a lot of people will be considering it. It is a little bit cheaper at $605, and if we break it down, the CPU's 350, the RAM's 115, and then the cheapest motherboard I would actually buy for this thing would be around $140. So yes, this is gonna be your cheapest option, but I do gotta let you guys know, I definitely would not recommend picking up a 5800X 3D system unless you're already on AM4. If you're already on AM4, it's gonna be so cheap that I could definitely see it making sense, but it is gonna have a similar amount of gaming performance to a 13600K, and depending on the memory you use, the 13600K should be a little bit faster in gaming, and it will absolutely annihilate the 5800X3D when it comes to multi-core performance. You gotta remember, 13600K has 20 threads, 5800X3D only has 16 threads, and it definitely shows. For example, if you were to look at like Cinebench numbers, uh, yeah, the 13600K is pulling in like 2600 points, whereas the 5800X3D from all the results I was seeing online was around 15,000. So yeah, that's a pretty massive difference in multi-core performance, and I definitely think it's worth the $20 premium. Now, I did also include the 7950X and 7600X, although honestly, when it comes to the 7600X, I think the platform cost is way too high, and it makes no sense versus the 13600K, considering the 13600K should be faster and cheaper. And when it comes to the 7950X, it's kind of in a weird spot. I think if you're really interested in multi-core performance, it could make sense for some, considering it is gonna be cheaper than really expensive DDR5 on a 13900K, uh, but if you're looking for the fastest, the 13900K with high-speed DDR5 definitely will be faster. Uh, so it's kind of in a weird spot where I'm not sure I would recommend it to many people. I, I think there is a niche of people that the 7950X could make more sense, but overall, people who are looking for the fastest are probably gonna be willing to shell out the extra couple hundred bucks. So overall guys, I'm gonna go ahead and say the 13th gen is an absolute banger when it comes to its price to performance with the i5. Now the i9 is bringing us new levels of performance. And I think if you want the best of the best, sure you might as well go with the i9. There's nothing else out there that can challenge it, especially when you pair it with some 7800 megahertz DDR5. But realistically, the best option is definitely gonna be that i5. The value it brings, especially when you pair it with DDR4, 
4 is absolutely incredible. Now, again, like I mentioned earlier, if you pair it with some B-Dye DDR4, you probably are going to get a little bit better results than I showed, and it's still going to be very, very inexpensive as a platform cost overall. Although I could definitely see some people picking up a 13600K and pairing it with some maybe a little bit cheaper DDR5 as well, as you probably will get a little bit better 1% and 0.1% lows on that stuff, depending on the games you play. And you still will have a platform where if you decide to upgrade the CPU, you could later on drop in a 13900K, although you aren't going to be able to probably drop in any next generation CPUs. So that's the only unfortunate part about it. But yeah, these CPUs are honestly bringing absolutely fantastic amounts of performance and right now i'm going to go ahead and say that the 13600k is probably the gaming cpu to buy if you're looking for a new CPU to drive those new graphics cards as it should have no issues whatsoever, making sure that you're getting the best out of your new GPUs. But hey, that's just what I think. What CPU do you think is the best option on the market right now? Let me know your guys' thoughts in the comments below. And of course, I'll see you in the next video. If you made it to the end of the video, be sure to drop a like. Every time you do so, AMD and NVIDIA release new GPUs. Also, if you want to see more, check out one of these related videos. You won't be disappointed.